$11 billion has just been paid out to people who claim that the popular herbicide and weed killer brand Roundup caused their cancer. Now, that might not be too surprising considering America's a giant dumpster fire right now, but I wanted to dive a little bit more into this, especially since I heard RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., talk about this on the Sean Ryan Show. So what environmental toxins became ubiquitous along that timeline? that could be responsible that you know could be and he said really there's only about 13 of them there's um the life is safe, which is in roundup the active ingredient in roundup which follow that timeline pretty perfectly then i see a post by dr andrea love who is a very well-known and uh, immunologist that i truly do truly respect however her stance was that it was completely safe and that was a little bit of conflicting information. An environmental attorney like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is saying it's not safe, but an immunologist like Andrea Love is saying it's safe. Common sense would lead to believe that the scientist knows better, but I wanted to learn a little bit more about this. And today I'm gonna share with you all of the crazy shit that I discovered while going down this rabbit hole. <laughs> So let's talk about what the fuck is in Roundup that is causing people to sue the brand Monsanto, the makers of Roundup. So Roundup contains a chemical called glyphosate. And glyphosate is an herbicide. Herb meaning plant, side meaning killer. It is a plant killer, or in this case, a weed killer. However, based on their EPA registration, it kills every single fucking thing in its path. <laughs> 68 different plants are listed as um, effective organisms that this thing works on. Now, glyphosate was introduced in 1974, and the way it works is this glyphosate stuff basically attacks the shikimic acid pathway. That's a lot. Again, I am I'm not an epidemiologist or biochemical or whatever, biomedical engineer. Um, however, from what I was able to deduce from what I found online is that the shikimic acid pathway is essentially this amino acid pathway. And if you remember anything from high school science, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So it's this protein synthesis pathway, essentially. Glyphosate comes in, cuts that shit out. This organism, this, these plants slash weeds, can't make the protein they need to survive, and so they die. As you can see, science is my life. And the theory is, since humans and animals don't have the shikimic acid pathway, that it doesn't really work on us, right? There's no real harm to us. So... This stuff works really fucking well, right? It is used globally to the point where by 2025, it is believed that an estimated 920 tons of this stuff is going to be used by the agricultural industry. That is 750,000 gallons of glyphosate being used globally to help farmers with their weed problems. So that brought me to my next question. Well, if this stuff is so good, how are people able to sue Monsanto, right? You can't just go to court and sue somebody and say, your stuff gave me cancer. You have to prove that. And it turns out that that proving portion is an actual thing. In, in legal terms, it's called a Daubert standard. And again, I'm not a lawyer, lawyer and this is not legal advice, but basically this Daubert standard has to be met before anybody can sue anybody else with a claim such as your stuff caused cancer. So there's something called a Daubert hearing. And during this Daubert hearing, the plaintiff or petitioner will say, hey, this is all of the evidence that I have supporting my claim that Monsanto's Roundup weed killer glyphosate stuff caused my cancer. If the judge says, okay, this is sufficient, we can move forward with the case, then they move on to the next phase, which can result in either them receiving a settlement from Monsanto or you know, them receiving nothing because there just wasn't substantial proof or whatever happened in the actual litigation process. Now, Monsanto hasn't lost all, you know, hasn't lost all of these cases, right? They're winning some of them, but the ones that they're losing have so far cost them $11 billion. And if you're wondering how many people are actually suing Monsanto, the answer is 165,000 people. And from all the cases that I was able to read, and I'll leave links to these cases if you want to go through them yourself, is that a majority of the people suing Monsanto are gardeners, landscapers, and people who were directly exposed to this stuff every single day for the most part for 20, 30 years, right? 
pretty much since Monsanto dropped. Now, if you're not familiar with the CFR 180, basically the CFR 180 is the federal standard for how much of this stuff or any chemical is allowed to be on our food. So I immediately went to that to figure out how much glyphosate are we allowed to have on our food? Like if these people are in direct contact with it, is there any harm to the general public? You know, the people that are consuming the food that farmers are growing or is there any harm to us if our landscaper is using it on our property? And what I found out was not really a straight answer. Between 0.1 and 400 parts per million are allowed to be on our food. So now I will say it varies between 0.1 and 0.7 is what we're allowed to have on things like lettuce and asparagus and cauliflower. But animal feed, so the stuff our livestock is eating, is allowed to be upwards of 400 parts per million. And I was like, well, that's fucking weird, right? I can consume a little bit. They can consume a lot of it. Pound for pound, that just didn't make too much sense to me. But hey, that's what the law says. So from there, as I continued to fall down this rabbit hole, I went to the EPA's website and I was like, okay, all these people are being sued. This Roundup stuff is still on the fucking shelves. I was at Lowe's the other day and it's still fucking there. So if this stuff is still on the shelves, but we have people saying it's causing their cancer, what does the EPA have to say about it? Because after all, they are the regulatory agency. Well, according to the EPA's website, they stand firmly on their statement that glyphosate is perfectly safe and is not harmful to humans. They go on to state that even though the International Agency of Research on Cancer deemed glyphosate possibly carcinogenic, they don't agree with that. And I was like, hold the fuck on. The International Agency of Research on Cancer is saying that this stuff is possibly carcinogenic? What? And that statement came out in 2015. But wait, there's more. So I was like, did they produce any research to you know, stand firmly against the fact that it could be carcinogenic? And the answer is no, I'll save you the, I'll save you the, the research. There are some international studies, but basically IARC said this stuff could be cancerous. EPA said, nah, fuck that. It's fine. Okay. How? How are we saying this stuff is fine when Monsanto's having to pay $11 billion, right? It's just something's not making sense. So I'm like, make it make sense. I'm confused and I'm worried. That's when I discovered that in 2018, when Monsanto went to renew their registration with the EPA in order to continue to produce glyphosate, that the EPA turned to the public and said, hey public, what do you think? Should we renew Roundup? Should we renew Monsanto's request for, you know, to continue to produce glyphosate? I didn't even know that. Did you know that? Did you know that the EPA will solicit responses from the public about possible registration renewals, which by the way, happen every 15 years, because I sure as hell fucking did it. How come that shit's not on the headlines? How come CBS, Fox, CNN, how come they're not saying, hey guys, by the way, there's this toxic chemical that's being produced and they're up for renewal. And the EPA wants to know, what the fuck do you think? I didn't know that. Anyway, I digress. So if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, I'm gonna post 11 of the comments that were on the EPA's website during Monsanto's 2018 registration renewal of glyphosate. But if you're not on YouTube and you're listening to this, I'm gonna read you some. The first comment says, ban glyphosate. We owe it to our children and the creatures we share this earth with. It is not a substance which should be so pervasive in our food, drink, soil, and water. Okay, let's continue. Please keep glyphosate out of our ecosystem. No, glyphosate should not be in our food. It should be labeled everywhere. It is found and labeled for what it is, a carcinogen. These comments go on, and I'm gonna show 11 of them on the screen right now. If you're listening to this, feel free to head to my website or watch this YouTube video where you can see all of these comments. We have William Callahan, PhD. He's saying this shit's not good for us. Manuela Hipkin, she submitted a whole fucking paper. We have Dana Lewis, Loomis, sorry, PhD, of professor of environmental health at Reno. She posted a whole fucking paper on it too. We also have a petition with 4,000 signatures. The shit was 215 pages. People saying, we do not want you to renew this, right? That doesn't fucking matter because guess what? The EPA renewed it despite a majority of the comments. There were 2,700 comments. A majority of them 
were from people saying to ban glyphosate. Yeah, sounds about right. What the fuck, right? How come there's more outrage around this, right? I looked, Monsanto also submitted some petitions. And when I looked at the Monsanto petitions, it was all farmers. Now, wait a second. How come the people saying to ban glyphosate are just pretty much regular people, but the people signing Monsanto's petition are all farmers? That's suspicious. That is suspicious. That is when I realized. Through some more research, I found in a Forbes article that Monsanto created genetically modified plant seeds, or what they call Roundup resistant plant seeds, that are immune to glyphosate. Okay, well, kind of keeping with Hanlon's razor, which is never a tribute to malice, but can be adequately explained by stupidity, which I don't think this was stupidity. I think this was opportunity. In 1974, Monsanto comes out with glyphosate as Roundup, and they say, this is the best shit on the market, and people use it, and they're like, wow, this literally does kill everything in its path, plants and grasses. But farmers are like, I want to use it, but it's going to kill my plants. So when GMOs kind of hit the market in the 90s, Monsanto was like, boom, here you go. Here's a Roundup-resistant seed. So you can continue to use our Roundup, and you don't have to worry about killing your plants. Now, if I'm a farmer and your livelihood depends on your output, your crop output, and you're managing dozens or hundreds of acres, and you want to make sure that you're able to maximize your profit, right? I want to be able to utilize every single square inch of my property because that my livelihood depends on it. It makes sense. It makes sense that Monsanto created a GMO plant seed. What was kind of weird, though, is that they made these farmers sign contracts. The contracts basically said, you can use our plant seeds, you can purchase our plant seeds, but you cannot save the seeds from the plants that are produced. So if you have a genetically modified, I don't know, corn, you can't save the corn and use that next year. Now, again, playing a little bit of devil's advocate here, I'm like, well, I know a little bit about pollination germination and I have my own little vegetable garden. So I was like, well, maybe something happens or some sort of like genetic mutation in the second generation or cross-pollination issues for the second generation, which would cause Monsanto to have a little bit of a concern, which is why they have farmers say that they're not going to, you know, save the seeds. But then I wondered, no, no, there are a lot of plants out there whose seeds you cannot save because they are, they are trademarked, essentially, by the company who created the plant. So that would tell me that Monsanto created a monopoly over the Roundup-resistant plant seeds. Take that for what you will. We'll say we'll earmark that. You can leave a comment on what you think, but I'm leaning a little bit more towards they own the seeds. They own the patent, the trademark, copyright, whatever you want to call it. It's their, it's their intellectual property, if you will. It's their property. They produce the seeds. They sell the seeds. You cannot produce the seeds because they own the rights to them. Okay, so that's a little interesting, but that really doesn't answer the question as to how $11 billion is paid into lawsuits for a product the EPA and everybody is saying is safe. I'm, I'm confused. Right? So I did a little bit more research, and I don't want to cherry pick research here, so I'm going to leave all of the research I found, the research that I found that says that glyphosate is safe, and the research that I found that says glyphosate isn't safe, because science you know, science is malleable. There's not any real one decision usually. And even if there is one decision that a lot of scientists tend to lean towards, that doesn't mean that there isn't science out there that contradicts that decision. So one article I found is called The Exposure to Glyphosate-Based Herbicide and Risk for Non-Hodgkin's Lymphoma, which is what they're saying is the primary cancer that you are more susceptible to for long-term exposure to glyphosate. And this is a meta-analysis and supporting evidence. This came out in September 2019 by a journal called the Mutant Research, Mutation Research, rather. And what they say is that long-term exposure to glyphosate increases your risk of developing cancer by 41%. Now, moving past the abstract on like 99% of Google University graduates out there, this study does contain animal um, animal studies, so maybe take it with a grain of salt, but I was like, wow, 41%, that's, uh, that's a lot of percent, so I'm like, let me see if I can find another article, 
The next one I found is Toxic Effects of Glyphosate on the Nervous System, a Systematic Review. Now, I'm going to read this verbatim for what the article or what the research study says. And I'm not going to read all of the examples here, but you'll get the gist. It has been shown that exposure to this pesticide, it's an herbicide, whatever, during the early stages of life, meaning human development, can seriously affect normal cell development by deregulating some of the signaling pathways involved in this process, leading to alterations in differentiation, neuronal growth, and myelination. Like, okay, that's a lot of science there. What else does it say? The doses of glyphosate that produce these neurotic effects vary widely, but are lower than the limits set by regulatory agencies, meaning the tolerances I mentioned in the CFR, the study is saying that they're actually a little too high, and then we can see some serious effects at a cellular level at much lower doses than that when it comes to early stages of life. It goes on to say, it is unequivocal that exposure to glyphosate produce important alterations in the structure and function of the nervous system of humans, rodents, fish, and invertebrates. It then says that glyphosate can be found in the urine of between 60 and 80% of the U.S. population. That is fucking worrisome because I was thinking really the people that would be affected by this are the people who are using it every day, like gardeners and farmers, and people that are using it by the boatload, like farmers and people who manage crops now that being said that's still a fucking concern right because this is essentially the backbone of our country they're the people making our fucking food these are blue collar workers who are maintaining our properties unbeknownst to us that in order to do those fucking things they're increasing the likelihood that they develop cancer now this was a little worrisome i then found some articles and some research studies saying that hey listen Based on our research, it was statistically insignificant, right? There there wasn't really any proof that glyphosate caused cancer. But a lot of those studies, one predominantly used in Andrea Love's newsletter, said was a study only conducted in Iowa and North Carolina. And I was like, okay, that's good, right? It's good that there is not a lot of evidence showing that people in those areas can develop cancer by using glyphosate long term. But long term, I would say take with a grain of salt. I'll leave a link to that research article in the comments. Again, the science is on both sides of the fence here. And all I want to know is does this shit fucking cause cancer or does it increase the likelihood that you will develop cancer? Something that is not being answered by this research. And if the EPA turns around in 15 years and wants to renew the registration for glyphosate, I want to be able to say confidently, yes, renew it or no, don't fucking renew it, right? I think that's really the question that everybody wants answered, and I'm sorry to say this, I can't really answer that for you. I'm just presenting what I found in the research, and I'm, I really do recommend that you check out these links, you read the research for yourself, and you come up to, to, you know, to your own conclusion, and when the EPA turns around and asks the public again for their input, that you actually put your input. Now, I know I said it doesn't count, they, the EPA did whatever they wanted anyway, and I honestly think that's because there's not enough exposure There's not enough news coverage on things like this. Now, in this same study, they did say, and I think that this is important, that both glyphosate and its metabolite, AMPA, can increase blood-brain barrier permeability, possibly by interfering with the proteins that mediate the hermetic junctions between the endothelial cells that comprise the blood-brain barrier. They also continue to say that exposure takes time, possibly because it takes time to alter the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. That's fucking concerning, right? Now, again, 165,000 lawsuits filed against Monsanto, now Bayer. $11 billion paid out already. That's a lot of fucking money for something that's supposed to be safe. We have the EPA sending firm against, you know, sending firm with their you know, opinion, I would say, that this stuff doesn't cause cancer. Although the 54 studies that they've conducted are primarily on soil and animals and the environment and not on humans. So what I would like to see is a long-term fucking study. If you're going to take anything away from today's episode, it is that we should be asking for a long-term study. I want you to follow 
somebody in New York City, somebody in fucking Tulsa, Texas, California, a farmer, a gardener, a school teacher, a vegan, a carnivore, follow fucking everybody. There should be a very good representation of the general public in this study that follows them, their potential exposure to glyphosate, and did any of them develop cancer? Was there a predisposition to cancer? Was their diet shit and that contributed to the increase in their likelihood of, of getting cancer, right? Like, can we do a long-term fucking study? Because, again, like everything we fucking do in this country, we go balls to the wall. 1974, this stuff dropped and we were like, this shit is awesome, use it everywhere. And then we did and now we're like, ooh, it could be carcinogenic and we're like, meh. The, or the EPA is like, meh. I will just say this, I have kind of lost a little bit of faith in the EPA and I would love to see, now they are the Environmental Protection Agency, so I can understand why they didn't do a ton of research into human studies, caveat there, right? But where the fuck is the FDA, the CDC, where is everybody else? With that being said, read the research, do your own research, and at the end of the day, it is up to us to do something about it, right? It is up to the American public. If we don't like what the fuck is happening in our country, it is up to us, it is up to us, right? It is up to us to go through the research. It's up to us as the average person to determine whether or not we want this stuff to be used in our environment. Now, yes, I have lost some faith in the EPA, but that really has a lot to do with what RFK said later on in his interview on the Sean Ryan show about how these research institutes that are federally funded are actually earning a profit from Big Pharma. And in 1980... We passed a law called the Bayh-Dole Act, and that law said that NIH scientists who work on new drugs get to keep royalties for them. So, so and NIH gets to keep royalties. You gotta be kidding. No. So the Moderna vaccine, a good example. NIH owns half of the Moderna vaccine. And I'll get in, more into that into the next episode. But until next time, I'll see you on the flip side. Mm.